Welcome to Paranormal Almanac. With your host, Kurt Sandvik. That's right, I'm your host, Kurt Sandvig, and on this week's edition of Paranormal Almanac, let's talk more about Haunted Hollywood, one of my favorite things. But first, as always, we've got shout-outs, but before I get to the shout-outs, I want to do a little intro that may or may not work. Let's see what happens. Nope, it did not work. So we're going to try that one more time. That's right. If you're listening to this as the podcast, like everybody does up until this episode, you might be going, what the hell was that about? Well, I'm also recording this episode for YouTube. That's right. Go to youtube.com slash paranormal dash or underscore paranormal underscore almanac. Just look for paranormal almanac. I mean, it should be fairly easy to find. Here's what we're going to be doing on YouTube. I'm going to be tempting. Uh, I'll try this one out. This is a test. Uh, recording the episodes live on YouTube. Warts and all, because I don't know how to edit these the way I'm doing it. So let's see what happens. Sure. And I'll be posting new videos after I after I submit them to my or after I show them to my patrons. I'll then I'll then be putting them out here on YouTube. See, I told you words and all. I'm already stumbling. I'll throw them here on YouTube where you can watch them at all. And I'm also uploading every new episode, starting from the last week's episode or two weeks up two weeks ago episode. Every new episode will be on YouTube, audio only. And if I can get it to work, and I've already talked to my uh, YouTube streamer, distributor, service, whatever, um, my uh, my podcast service, uh, if I can get it to work, I'm going to start doing some of the classic episodes as well, like the Debbie Moffat episode. So you can listen to it on YouTube. So hopefully this opens up Paranormal Almanac to a whole new audience. I don't know why you want to watch me while I'm reading stuff. Not really reading, but the outlines and stuff while I'm doing an episode, but here you go. If you want to, here you go. Anyhow, now it's shout out time. Shout outs going out to the patrons. Head on over to patreon.com slash paranormal almanac. The patrons are what make this show happen. So if you like this show, head on over to Patreon for little as a dollar a month. You'll get extra episodes. You'll get bonus content. You'll get a whole bunch of fun stuff. Plus you help pay for this episode, this show. Uh, the patrons have bought me every piece of paranormal equipment that I have. And, uh, that's a lot too, by the way, I'm, I've now stockpiled a bunch of paranormal equipment for all of the, uh, paranormal investigations I'm doing. Um, but yeah, I can't thank the patrons enough. So if you want to support the show on YouTube, make sure you click, click like subscribe and leave a comment below. And this comment below for this week is was Bella Lugosi into the paranormal at all? Yes or no? Or I don't know. Whatever you want to say. Put that in the comment below. I'll ask other questions. Don't worry. You can throw that in the comments as well. But shout outs going out to Charles Hunt, Lori, Alec, Roger, Kimberly, Adam, Karen, Ethan, Duran, James loves Nikki, Lori, Alicia, Rebecca, Ann, Stephen Cher, Jane Ann, Jennifer, Heather G, your friendly neighborhood skinwalker, Zuzu's, what's it? Nico Share and the Mouse, Mark and Tina, Mike from Jersey, Jay Bizzle, Andy, Tracy, Virginia, Tony the Magician, Jason, Vicky, Crow, Clay, Buzz, Libido Works, Tom, Glacier Main, Isabel, Jen, Jen, Stacy, Amber, Tracy, Kelly, Joe, Menace the Beast, Kick Ass Magic, Robot, Webcomic, Sandy, Paige, Couch, Bentman 666, Andrew, Scott A, 
Andrea, Melody, Vanessa, Marisol, Liam, Roger, Becca, Jake, Charlotte, and the Beasties, Jennifer, or Jen, sorry, Elizabeth, Sherry, Art Muffin, Tim, Kenneth, Ricky, Alexander, George, those are the demon. <laughs> Hayden, Cindy, Ashley, Carrie, Robin, Will, Lauren, Russell, Isabel, Audra, Dorian, Cindy, Bob, Paula, Jerry, Jeff T, Joe, Lawrence, the Lawrence Strawn. Hey, howdy, hi, on video. Autumn, J Mark, Manning, Carolyn, Ryan loves Melina. Melina? Melina. I think it's Melina. Ryan, you love her. That's all that, that's all that matters. And I love you both. Jade, Nanashi, Todd, Jamie, and Elijah Henderson, Dan, Laura Pitts, and Gamer Fan. For any of the $25 patrons that haven't done so yet, please, on Patreon or email me at paranormalalmanac at gmail.com. Um, email me the shirt that you want. Go to tpublic.com slash stores slash paranormal dash almanac. Pick this, pick the style of shirt. Go, yep, I want this shirt in this color, in this size, and your address, and I'll send it right over to you for being a phenomenally cool patron. That's right. Patrons get stuff too, because that's how cool they are. Um, I used to have a bunch of intros on uh saved. I mean, I have no idea where they are. Let's see. Can I, can I, let's, maybe it's this one. Let's hope it is. Here's a quick 10 second intro for all you new YouTube listeners. Hey, it worked. Uh, I also have two special shout outs before I get going with the show. Uh, that's to Joe Teague and to my boy Stitch. All righty, let's get right on in to Paranormal News. Strange things happen every day. Keep a watch out to be on the way. That's just the way the universe moves. But now it's time for Paranormal News. How cool is that? All righty, the first story in Paranormal News, and if there's video, I'm going to try and play it for you guys. The first story in Paranormal News, most haunted place in America is site of an unsolved double murder. There are countless places across the U.S. that are home to unexplained happenings, but not many top the list of Lance Zales, or Zales, most haunted. He's the founder of the tour company, U.S. Ghost Adventures. He has had his fair share of spooky places, and he says... Uh, let's see. I don't care about his backstory. I mean, I'm sure that's great, and I love you. You're a great guy. But uh, let's get to this, the actual house itself. Here we go. Uh, he believes that one that the most haunted place in America, not surprisingly, is Lizzie Borden's house in Fall Rivers, Massachusetts. It was once owned by Andrew and Abby Borden, who purchased the property in 1872 due to its location amid horse stables, stores, and a makeshift restaurant. Uh, there they lived until uh, Lizzie Borden, and if you don't know what happened, spoiler, uh, yeah, she killed them all, um, or so the legend goes. So there you go. If you want the most haunted place in America, Lizzie Borden, you can't really go wrong with that. I'm, I'm kind of with that one. All right, this next one has a video. It's a video that I have watched. Now, normally, I typically don't want, uh, I don't watch the videos until it's time to do the show, but for this one. A hundred percent. I had to watch this video, but I'm sure there's going to be a commercial. So hold on. Oh, it's not actually. Even better. So let's see how I can do split screen. I want to watch you guys. I want you guys to watch this. No, there's got to be a way to make it bigger than that. There we go. Why is that? What is happening? Oh, fine doesn't want to do it so do it this way there we go now it's going to do a commercial guaranteed because i have it up on the screen no it doesn't all righty so here you have I just squatted down. it is really good <laughs> it'll be over here, if you're watching it on YouTube. An elusive creature. All right, just squat it down. Yeah, let me see your camera. I'll do it. What I'm talking about for those listening to the podcast. What I'm talking about for those listening to the podcast at home. 
is the video that is everywhere right now of a Southwest Colorado couple that were on a train ride where they saw perfectly saw the most glorious Bigfoot in the world. Now, I don't want to say it's not real, but uh, the hair on this Bigfoot is magnificent. Uh, I'm going to play it again, This the zoomed in version. Uh, I want to, um, yeah, here we go. That is as clear as we can get it. I mean, that is a Bigfoot, a person in a Bigfoot costume or a Bigfoot walking from right to left until it notices the train is seeing them. And then it kind of like goes, oh God, and then squats down trying to hide with the rest of the stuff. I like actually enough of that. I really like, um, I really like the squat down. That makes sense to me. If there is a creature that is, and there is, Bigfoot's real. It, but I'm saying if this was really a Bigfoot, if he's walking across these this rocky mountainous area with like the stage sagebrush or whatever that is, and he notices like, oh shit, I'm being watched. It does seem logical to me that he would duck down and try to blend in with the surroundings. But I don't know what's around there. Is it... Nothing for a hundred miles. If so, that's a Bigfoot. Why would someone go out a hundred miles out by themselves in a Bigfoot costume on the chance they're going to be seen by a train? Because sure, they can say, oh, well, I know a train's going to go by at this time. So if I just walk by, there's a chance that someone on the train will see me, but not a hundred percent. The other thing, so I don't know about that. If, if I can find out where this location is, what's around this location, if like I said, if there's nothing around it for a hundred miles, Okay, I'm thinking it might be a Bigfoot. But if you're telling me there's a road just on the other side of the train tracks or a town just on the other side of the train tracks, that's a dude in a costume. Also, I know that there's some really, really mellow people in this world, but the video starts with that guy going, that's an elusive creature. Not like, holy fuck, Marge, that's a Bigfoot. Right there, there's a Bigfoot stop the train, like pulling on that little thingy that's supposed to stop trains. I don't know if they do that anymore, but if it was, I would have ripped that thing off the bulkhead to be like, fucking Bigfoot right there. You let everybody watch this Bigfoot. Put your cameras on. Go look at the Bigfoot. So he's a little too mellow for me. There's also a theory. Well, not a theory. There's also a um Something going around. I don't can't think of the word I want to say. There's something going around right now on certain sites saying that it's a a bit like the train does it, like to see if you can spot the Bigfoot. Have your all right, people. We're in the area of the Bigfoot, like you're like at Disneyland. Like all right, we're in the old west now. Make sure you kind of keep your eyes out for Native Americans, like that kind of a thing. But for Bigfoot, and then there's just a guy that walks by and goes like whoa, and then then squats down. So there is there is like a Reddit rumor mill going on that that's the case, but I can't find anything to say that there's a train out there that you can take where they, you know, have a Bigfoot sighting, you know, set up for you at all. So there's a lot of investigation that I need to do on this one. Um, it's neat. I'll give you that. I mean, there's a lot of people going yeah, it's real. I saw one back in Turkey in 1996. Yeah, it's real. I saw one I was hunting in 80, 1986. Look, Bigfoot are real. They have been seen by every indigenous people around the planet. The very round planet for all you YouTube listeners. Um, if you think the earth is flat, you are not going to like this show. Uh, so there is something to Bigfoot. I think Bigfoot is real and Bigfoot is just very good at hiding, rightfully so. But is this one... I can't 100% say yes. Can't say no, but right now, I don't know. His hair just looked too pretty. It was just the prettiest Bigfoot you've ever seen in, in your life. It just was too clean, too pretty. Seems to me that if it was out there living, and every time anybody does see a Bigfoot, they always go, oh, this smelled, smelled like a skunk. Oh, it's all dirty and gross. It smelled like a skunk. That one looks like it would smell like Hawaiian breeze. Like, You'd see it and you'd go, hmm, oh, smells like uh, like Fiji rainfall shampoo and conditioner in one, you know, that kind of a thing. That's what that looked for me. Just a little bit too good. But I hope it is. I hope it is. All righty. Uh, the next story is a continuation of that. It is that story. It is Bigfoot spotted walking through rural Colorado. We were looking for elk. Okay. Like, cool. 
A couple taking a train ride through rural Colorado sent Bigfoot enthusiast, Bigfoot enthusiast into a frenzy after posting a footage of a mysterious figure walking through the mountains online, which you two people, you just saw. Uh, podcast people, head on over to the Facebook page, the Paranormal Almanac fan page, and I'll put the video up there so you can see it there. Uh, Shannon Parker and Stetson Tyler were traveling on the narrow gauge train from Durango to Silverton and were looking for elk when they spotted movement on the mountainside. Now, a video captured by a fellow passenger shows a large bipedal creature moving across the pass before stopping and squatting at its haunches. After leaving Silverton, heading back to Durango, I asked Stetson to help me look for elk in the mountains. As we were passing by the mountains, Stetson sees something moving and says, I think it's Bigfoot. Brandon, the guy sitting next to Stetson on the train, grabs his phone and starts recording. Out of the hundreds of people on the train, three or four of us actually saw it, as Stetson says in the video, the ever-elusive creature Bigfoot. I don't know about you all, but we believe it. Mrs. Parker later told the New York Post that the creature had been at least six, seven, or taller, feet tall, or taller, and had been camouflaged amongst the mountain sage. Oh, that's what it was, mountain sage, not uh, sagebrush. Oh, wait, sagebrush, mountain sage? Maybe it is the same. I don't know. I'm not a cowboy. Don't if you're here for cowboys, this is the wrong video. Look at the way I'm dressed. I'm not a cowboy. Um, he said that he went he went out snowshoeing in these mountains before and seen footprints that were larger and much of the much of the bigger stride and of a much bigger stride than snowshoes would have been. All right, so now we kind of know where the area was between Durango and Silverton. All right. Uh train between Durango. And Silverton, why it comes right up. Gee, I wonder why. Um, this unforgettable trip takes you up into the Rocky Mountains with views of the San Juan National Forest. Okay, I want to see what it looks like. Can I see a map version of it? Here we go. The narrow gauge railroad right there. Perfect. Jesus, that is rugged to say the least hold on i might have to throw this up on the screen in fact i am give me one second i'm gonna put this up on the sc screen as well see this is my first time doing it so there's gonna be a little bit of uh figuring stuff out but uh you know i'll figure it out here we go Alrighty, so this is, if you're watching the YouTube video right now, this is it. This is that train ride, and I'm going to zoom in. Depending on where it was on the train, it is insanely rugged. But there are, like, RV parks and stuff on the other side of the train, or train tracks. It just depends on where they saw it. Like, I would need to find out exactly where they saw it, because... Theoretically, you know, if it's out this way, yeah, there's nothing there. And someone would have to hike for miles. But, you know, you just zoom in just a little bit. That's a town. That's a town. That's a town. Sure. All you'd need to do is, again, get on the back of an ATV, have them cruise you up there in your Bigfoot costume, wait for the train. You know what time it's going to go by. Wait for the train to go by. Boom. Instant fame as a Bigfoot. So. Interesting, but I can't, I, until I find out where exactly it is, and I'll try to search even more, try to find out more information, but for right now, I don't know, seems kind of, uh, kind of pretty. Alrighty, up next in paranormal news, you got a ring camera? Well, if you do, ring offers $1 million if you catch an extraterrestrial on your security device. Now, I don't have a ring camera, I've got another kind of camera, blink camera, so I'm wondering if ring would still give me the money, but. I mean, if I catch it, I'm just going to tell them, oh, yeah, I was on a ring. Yeah, it was great. So Ring is offering $1 million to anyone who captures an unaltered scientific evidence of extraterrestrial life on their doorbell camera. With new sightings and further evidence that life forms might exist beyond the Earth's atmosphere, there's a possibility that extraterrestrial activity could be happening right outside your front door. Right now. Go look. I'm not going to get up because if I run over there and look, my dog's going to get all excited. And then I got to sit back down and she's doing great. She's doing fantastic work. Yes, I love you, Rum. You're a good girl. Don't go looking outside for aliens. And if you do see one, just bark, and then I'll come running. With new sightings and further evidence that life exists, you can look outside your front door. To be eligible, you must 
upload the video of the alien by November 3rd, 2023. That's not a lot of time, people. Give us a little bit more time. All video submissions will be reviewed by space and extraterrestrial experts, according to Ring. Who? Who is that? Who is the space and extraterrestrial expert? I want that job. That's got to pay pretty well. Hey, Ring, hire me. I'll be a space and extraterrestrial expert. Uh, anyone who meets the criteria will be contacted directly for the next steps. If a grand prize is awarded, the $1 million will be paid out as an annuity of $50,000 for 20 years. Is that right? 50000 times 20 is a million? Sure, why not? I don't want to do math. I was told there'd be no math in YouTube. If no real extraterrestrials are captured on video, Ring is offering a $500 prize for creative interpretation. <coughs> Excuse me, I got too excited. For created creative interpretation of an ET sighting? All right, I'm back in. I'm not going to fake anything, but I might make a fun one with like rum or something. That'd be cool. Or, or you know, put myself in one of those like body suits or something like that. Out of this world prize submissions will be judged based on creativity, humor, engagement with a ring device, and more as defined in the official rules. Ring may also feature videos on social media that are tagged with at ring and use hashtag ring million dollar sighting. All right, cool. If you got a ring camera, start fucking around. Get some money. That seems cool. Or find a real alien and put that on there. All righty, up next in paranormal news. I got a lot to get to. I've only been gone for like 10 days, nine days, and there's a crap ton of paranormal news. So I'm going to cruise through these next ones. Why NASA wants your UFO videos? Because they're greedy little fuckers, and they want to put it on a ring camera and then make a lot of money. Uh, no, last year, the topic of UFOs, yeah, we all know that. Why does UFO, I, here we go. NASA wants to start reviewing all of them independently and let them let us know what they find. There, that is their, that is the quickest way I could cruise through that one. That's what they want. They want to look through all of the videos that they find and see if there are any genuine videos that um, might prove that aliens exist. Hey, look, give NASA some credit. Like the government, I'm not sure if they're going to share. NASA, I hope they'll share. I really hope that NASA is going to be cool and start sharing this stuff. Um, we'll see. Up next in paranormal news. Exclusive. I've handled the Mexican alien mummies that set the world alight last month. I don't think they're aliens. I think there's something much scarier. Oh, wait, hold on. Scarier. Yeah, that's all right. Uh, look, they're not real, but I'll continue reading this story. A UFO enthusiast who's seen two supposed alien mummies up close has revealed they're probably not ETs, but the miniature corpses presented in Mexico last month by Jaime Musam, a controversial journalist. That's an understatement. Uh, well, ufologist Will Gallison, who is a close friend of the archaeologist, so of course I trust him, uh, he first analyzed the supposed aliens. He said he believes the corpses are dummies. He believes the corpses are dummies. What? Corpses are dummies that are a thousand years old, but he doesn't think they're a hoax. He said they may have been made from animal remains a millennia ago, possibly for ritual purposes, with the heads bearing a remarkable similarity to alp alpaca skulls. Kurt here. It's because they are alpaca, skull, alpaca skulls. A hundred percent. It's fake. They're fake. They weren't made a thousand years ago. They're fake. But let's continue with him. Gallison, who's performed with Sting, Barbara Streisand, Carly Simon, and Chaka Khan. What? He saw the mummies in 2017 in Peru. A lot. Yeah, when it was proven they were fake. And he traveled to see them initially. He says, why do I care that he's, he's, oh, I didn't realize he performed with Sting, Barbara Streisand, and Carly Simon. Now this guy knows exactly how to tell that these fake aliens are actually fake aliens made a thousand years ago. The crap is happening with this dude. Uh, let's continue on. He said in a documentary interview with UFO TV show, Nub TV, that he visited Peru twice and even took a cast of one of the mummy's heads. He says, I'm friendly with friendly with a French archaeologist, whatever the hell his name is. He received these mummies in 2016 from a tomb robber. He was very surprised and upset at the press conference. He said, this is the first time extraterrestrial life was presented in such a form. And I think there is a clear demonstration that we're dealing with non-human species. Yeah, get to it. How do you know it's a thousand years old, dude? No, I'm not reading any more of your BS until you tell me how. 
Uh, yes, but uh, he said, oh, I even saw a back of a deer skull once on a mantle. And I thought, wow, that looks just like the skull. Yeah, because it's not real. Um, he says, ah, here we go. It was obviously put together. The question is, was it put together in 2015 or was it made 1,000 years ago? I do not think they flew down in saucer and landed on Earth recently or even 1,000 years ago because a CT scan showed another thing according to some of the doctors that, that examined these. The leg bones on these things were suffering from osteoporosis. He said that uh, initially he was really invested in these things being real, but he remains curious as why an Incan culture 1,000 years ago would have made such creatures. Kurt here, so am I. Why are you saying that that's a thing that happened? Where did you come up with this? Obviously, they were made 1,000 years ago by an Incan culture. What the hell are you talking about, dude? He still wonders whether the mummies were a recreation of some form that the Incans had encountered. No. You're fucking dumb. No. No. I'm moving on. I, I'm not even going to read the rest of this story. He's an idiot. There's no proof they're a thousand years old at all. You're, you're talking shit. You're making shit up. Uh, let's see. Up next in paranormal news. No, that's the thousand-year-old idiot. I don't want to talk about him anymore. Here we go. Up next in paranormal news. You got 1.1 million pounds laying around around that you don't want you want to give to me so i can live next to loch ness well now's your chance because a 1.1 million dollar mansion that overlooks loch ness is up for sale a stunning home elevated the elevated above the village of dramnachrich in glanach i said that right youtube don't give me any shit you don't put anything in the comments about kurt can't say international places right you're right I admit, I can't say international places right. You don't have to put that in the comments because I'm saying that now. This beautiful eight-bedroom home near Loch Ness has been put on the market for over one million pounds. We've taken a look inside to see what it's like. Um, in a beautiful south-facing setting that is a stunning panoramic view of Loch Ness. Uh, let's see. Yeah, what about it? How many bedrooms? How many baths? Uh, it's about two miles away from shops, restaurants, doctor surgeries, and primary schools. The detached property was built in 2012. That's cool. Looks very pretty. Um, as you enter, you're greeted by a grand stone fireplace that is featured in the center of the kitchen diner, which adds warmth to the room. Nope, don't care. I mean, I care. It's pretty. Look at the window. There we go. Giant, ginormous windows that overlook Loch Ness. Now you got me. I don't care about the kitchen counters. I don't care about Moving upstairs, the cozy area. I don't care about the primary bedroom. Oh, it's very pretty. I like that color. Uh, what I do care about is it overlooks Loch Ness. So if you have, a, like I said, if, and it's a big if, but if you got 1.1 million that you just like, I don't know what to do this. It's just sitting there collecting dust. Well, send it to me. I'll go buy a house in Loch Ness and I'll have you over for drinks. I'll make it like a cool little tiki bar. I bet you any money. If I put a tiki bar in this place, which is what I would do, um, if I put a tiki bar in this house, it would be the only tiki bar that overlooks Loch Ness. Tell me people wouldn't come from miles around to go to my tiki bar. It'd be amazing. There's your money. Make I'll, I'll make back your money real quick. All righty, up next in paranormal news. Yeah, we're almost done. Don't worry. Two historic homes at 31 and 35 North Street in Plymouth are rumored to be haunted, and they're for sale. That's right. I love... Okay, thank you. I love haunted homes that are for sale right now, and there's two of them. Unfortunately, that's all this says. What? How? 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 Come on, give me some more info. Here we go. Nope. I got some funky music. I want to know how much these houses are, but it doesn't tell me anything. It just plays shit in music. And I don't want to listen to the shitty music anymore. Let's move to the next story. Yeah, there you go. So look it up. 31 and 35 North Street in Plymouth. There you go. Um, they're brand new. They're possibly haunted. They're for sale. Um, yeah, I think it's Plymouth, Massachusetts. Yeah, it is. It's Plymouth, Massachusetts. And finally, in the from the oops, I forgot to read this one part of Paranormal News. What do you do if you see a chupacabra in Texas this summer? Well, past summer. What do you do if you see a chupacabra in Texas this Halloween? Well, this site will tell you. KXAN says, 
The chupacabra, sometimes referred to as the chupacabra, is one of the, uh, really? A chupacabra? Sometimes referred to as the chupacabra. The chupacabra. We all know what he looks like, but what do you do if you come across it? Well, they said the most likely explanation for the sightings of the creatures are There is actual science to explain the creature. As explained, reports of the gray-skinned, patchy-furred, dog-like beasts line up with the appearance of a coyote with mange. So if you do see a chupacabra, chances are you're seeing a coyote with mange, in which case, don't hurt it. Don't kill it. It's not worth killing. Please don't kill it. Let it, don't fucking shoot chupacabra. That that goes, you know, it's universal. It's not, don't fucking shoot Bigfoot or the Loch Ness, not a monster, or chupacabra, for the love of God. Alrighty, with that, let's take a quick break. Uh, we'll be right back in just two seconds. And um, there's got to be some kind of little music or bumper music that I can play for this. Uh, let's try. This one. We are back. That's right. We're back. And keeping with the Halloween season. Sure. It's been like 10 days since I did the last episode. I had two Puddle Pity, Puddles Pity Party concerts to go to last Thursday and Friday. So that right there takes precedence over this podcast. Sorry, everybody. I love you all. I love the fact you listen to this podcast. But if I would get a chance to go see Puddles Pity Party, I'm doing it. So I did. So instead of doing it on Thursday and Friday, and then obviously Saturday and Sunday, insanely busy, I'm doing it now. The episode's coming out now. But to make you feel slightly better, I hope, the next episode has already been recorded. It's going to be an interview episode, uh, I think. I think it's going to be the next one. Chances are it's the next one. But whatever, a future episode has already been recorded. It's going to be an interview with, uh, should I spoil it? Yeah, I'll spoil it. If you don't want to listen, skip ahead 30 seconds, podcast people. For you two people, I don't know how to skip ahead 30 seconds, so you're just going to hear it. Um, it's with Living for the Dead, the new Hulu Disney Plus show, Living for the Dead. It is a fantastic show. Uh, I was lucky enough to watch it all. Um, I got to see the streamers. I can't talk about it yet, but I'm going to interview the cast of the show. Uh, this is the one, in case you're like really into the paranormal, I talked about it a while ago. Uh, this is the one that Kristen Stewart did an audition for quite a while ago. Um, Looking for LGBTQIA. I think I got it right. I please, I hope I get it right. If I every time I say it wrong, I feel so bad. Um, individuals that are paranormal investigators or have some connection to the paranormal, and they did a paranormal investigation show with these people. It's fantastic. Um, if you want to know a little bit more about it, you can go watch the trailer. It's on everywhere, YouTube, right here. If you're watching it on YouTube, pause real quick, do a new tab, watch that trailer, come back. But um, I will say the cast is fantastic uh, on the show and in person. When I talk to them, uh, I, I cannot say the nicer things about them. I got to talk to um, Alex, who is fantastic. Roz, fantastic. Juju, fantastic. Logan, fantastic. Ken, fan freaking tastic. After I got to talk to them, I was, it was really brief. Like it was a press junket. So I only got like five minutes each one, not even each one, like, in groups, five minutes and then five minutes. Um, so then I just reached out and said, like, you know, like message when Ken posted that he was going to do the press junk. And I said, hey, you know, uh, thank you so much for talking with me today. It was fantastic. And he wrote back something very, very, very sweet and very nice. And I was like, that's awesome. Thank you so much. Like, I really had a great time, too. And I said, you know, it bums me out. I didn't have more time because I had like a billion questions. And he's like, I'm free now. You want to talk? And I said, are you, can I put it? Can I record it? He's like, yeah. Instantly, he jumped on. We had the best, most casual, awesome conversation. I can't wait for you guys to hear about it. That's the hopefully the next episode. It's good. There's an embargo, so I got to make sure I don't, you know, burst the embargo. But I think it's not. I think it's next week. I'm allowed to talk about it. But as soon as I'm allowed to, let me put it this way: as soon as I'm allowed to, I'll put that episode up. Um, YouTube. There won't be any video of it. It's just audio. But um, I hope to have the rest of the cast on this show as well because. Honestly, I cannot say 
how cool they were. Uh, they were the nicest, nicest, coolest people in the world. And the show was fantastic. And it is not your typical paranormal investigation show in the best way possible. That's all I can say. Anyhow, but now I'm talking about this episode. Let's focus on this episode. And on this one, it's one of my favorite topics of all time. It's old Hollywood and haunted old Hollywood. Those are two of my favorite things put together right there. Now, again, like I said, I was super busy last week. I really apologize, but fear not. Um, I filmed the majority of my first real uh, outside this one, YouTube video. Uh, already. I just need to clean it up and then release that. I can't just put that out raw. I have, I've been wanting to do this episode forever. If you want a, a spoiler of what it's about, I think I talked about it already on last episode, but hold on. I'm basing my episode on this, the Black Dahlia Red Rose. It's a book by Pew Eatwell, and uh, it's a phenomenal book. Honestly, it is. I've read a lot of books on the Black Dahlia, and this is by far the best one that I've ever read. So I did being living in Hollywood, um, or close to Hollywood. I'm in Burbank, uh, living in Southern California. I said, why don't I go visit all of these locations? And why don't I, why don't I do like portable paranormal investigations at as many places as I can until I get kicked out? Uh, did I get kicked out? You'll have to wait and see. Uh, so anyhow, that one's already been filmed. I just got to clean it up. Then I'll release that. Um, the second episode or maybe the second part of this episode will be filmed on the 21st. I'm very excited about that. Uh, I've done a couple other small little things that I've recorded that I'm very excited about. But <clears throat> regular listeners, last week, you didn't, or last episode, you didn't hear me talk about Bella Lugosi, but the extended patron edition did. And I figured, well, if I want to talk a little bit about Bella Lugosi, why don't I talk a lot a bit about Bella Lugosi? Because this episode is going to be a big chunk devoted to Bella Lugosi. First, let me just say, there is a lot, a lot, a lot of BS about Bella Lugosi out there. It is insane. Where he lived, his connection to the paranormal, um, when he got married, when they got divorced, uh, there's, there's just tons of it. Uh, uh, the whole Bella Lugosi section of this episode is a grain of salt part of this episode. And if you can prove it, YouTubers, you wanted me to, uh, here's your thing down below. Here's the real thing you put down below. If you can prove to me that this next story I'm about to tell you is BS, let me know. But you better not just say, yeah, I heard it's BS or yeah, I looked into it and it's BS. No, no. I want facts. I don't want to just hear that. Oh, I, I heard it was fake. So it's fake. Uh, skeptical people said it was fake. No, no, no. Prove to me because that doesn't help me. I spent a long, long time researching this stuff to try and either 100% debunk it or 100% prove it. And I couldn't do either. You're going to hear some debunks in a second, but I can't disprove the entire story. That's what I'm looking for. And please, if you can, please let me know, because I love to say, yep, guess what? That one was BS. It's not real. If you're new to this show, know that I love nothing more than say, nope, that's not real, which you're going to find out in a second. Okay, here's what I could find. From what I could find, this story first appeared in 1929. Then it was reprinted and revised a bit in 1932, which happened all the time back then, still happens now especially with websites. People regurgitate BS over and over again and then add to it. But then that version, that 1932 version, was reprinted in 1960. So it's a big gap. It's almost like it is. It's a 30-year gap between the first version and the third version, and they added to them each time. Is any of it real? Grain of salt. Here's what I know. By 1929... Bella Lugosi had 34 credits to his name, the uh, theatrical credits, whether that be in the actual theater or movie credits. So he was a well-known celebrity by this time, obviously not like he was after he became Dracula. And that's all he was really known for, except for Ed Wood. Um, <clears throat> not like that, but he was 
he was still a big celebrity. So him being interviewed around that time, that 1929, yeah, totally would happen. That leads validity to the fact that this interview could have happened, probably happened. Um, but in this interview, he talks about his life before he came to America. And for this show, he talks about a woman with yellow eyes. And I don't mean just like a woman with jaundice eyes. I mean, cat eyes. He described them as cat-like eyes, yellow eyes that are cat-like eyes. So here's what I get. In a small town on the shores of the Adriatic called Abkhazia, sure, nailed that, um, 32-year-old, 32-year-old Bella Lugosi, he first met a woman who introduced, who, who introduced herself, blah, blah, who introduced herself as Hetty. Now, he said that she had yellow cat-like eyes, and the article changed in 1932 when it printed that Bella Lugosi claimed that he would never marry again because he, because he was afraid of the woman with the yellow eyes. Quote, he said, I was only a youth then, in the year 1914 age 32, when I met her and glanced into her eyes. It was though I had received a shock of electricity. It is utterly impossible to describe the fire, the ecstasy, which shot through my veins. I'm not doing a Bella Lugosi, like the ecstasy, which shot through my veins. No. In an instance, we were in each other's arms and the world was lost. He went on to describe her as her age was indeterminable. She was an actress. She was not outstandingly beautiful. All right, you didn't have to add that. That's kind of a dick move. Her hair was a pale brown. Her skin was deathly pale at times, and other times it was blood, blood red. That was when she had, that's when she had been fed. Okay. Her mouth was thin and ravenous. Her teeth were tiny and pointed. All right, maybe she wasn't outstandingly beautiful. All right, you're right. I take it back. There had been many lovers. One Never ask what I become of them. Come here, you. Hi, you. Welcome to YouTube. That's right. It's quick rum time. Hi, sweetheart. How's my girl? Welcome to YouTube, beautiful. The YouTube peoples are going to love you. Yes, they are. Can I finish reading my Bella Lugosi story about this creepy lady? All right. All right. Where'd we leave off? Oh, yeah. She had either white skin or blood red skin. She had tiny, tiny teeth, and they were pointed, and she was ravenous. Um, there had been many lovers. One never asked what had become of them. Men feared her and went to her at, com at her command. Husbands left their wives because of her. All right. So like I said, that was all added in the 1932 reprint of the version of the story. That first one, he didn't go into any of those details. So, hmm, grain of salt's getting a little bigger. Uh, so anyhow, he start, according to these stories, he started to see her and had, quote, Three wondrous weeks of romance and passion until one night he had to run an errand. And upon his return, he found the apartment that he was sharing with Hetty stripped of all her belongings that she, he said she had vanished without a trace into the night. She left a note on the table, which read, we may never see each other again, but remember you are mine always. All right, Hetty. Stalker, creepy cat lady. Take it down about 20%. Uh, he said he felt abandoned and distraught, so he tried to search for her for weeks. He said, she was gone, and I could not find her, and for weeks I could not eat. I could not sleep. I tell you, I was a crazy, stark mad man. Um, it was then the Great Wars that saved him. Uh, he got called to service. He rose to the rank of 2nd Lieutenant in the 43rd Infantry Regiment, twice wounded, sent back to Budapest to recover. Okay. Then it kind of jumps ahead a little bit. Four years later, he married his first wife, Iona Smitsk, Smitsk, S-Z-M-I-K, Sismik, Sismik, sure, why not? That sounds like uh, something out of Elf. Uh, but anyhow, uh, let's see, it. after the armistice in 1918, Lugosi returned to the Royal National Theater. He says, I tell you, we were happy. Two people could not be more happy. I returned to my work with a fresh enthusiasm. Through enthusiasm. My future seemed assured, and I loved Iona as she loved me. Uh, so he turns to the theater. He's happy until. Yeah, you guessed it. Creepy cat lady. Uh, so uh, creepy cat eyed lady. She, she said one night as he was preparing to take, th take to the stage, he said, 
No sooner had the curtain risen than I knew something was wrong. I was not myself. I forgot my lines. I acted like a dummy. Then suddenly, my gaze seemed drawn to a seat in the front row. There, her great yellow eyes, glowing like a cat's, sat Hetty. Yeah, you didn't have to say the sat Hetty part. We all guessed it was Hetty. If it was another lady with yellow cat eyes and tiny sharp teeth, I don't know. Excuse me. He said, my blood turned to water in my veins, and my limbs trembled so that I could hardly walk. As I looked into her yellow eyes, something happened to me. I managed to finish the play, and when I hurried from my dressing room to find her, she was gone. Tom, what are you doing, crazy girl? No, that's not a toy. Let's not destroy that. Thank you. Uh, where did we go? Oh, yeah, so she's gone. Poof, gone. Now, the article says... Their, ma their marriage fell apart, so he got a divorce and went looking for Hetty. But I was like, that seems kind of weird. More reliable sources say the couple divorced after Lugosi was forced to flee his homeland for political reasons, risking execution if he stayed, and Iona didn't wish to leave her parents. More plausible. So um, the article says, again, L Lugosi tried in desperation to find the mysterious woman who had seemed to have an enchantment upon him. Night after night, he thought about her. I tried to find her, but failed. At night, I lay awake trying to solve the mystery of this strange woman who, with her stranger power, was keeping her promise that she would always, that we would, that we should belong always to only each other. Weird way of saying that, but sure. Okay. September 1921. He marries Hung Hung Hungarian actress. Yes, I know. I know you're right there, Rum. You're a good girl. Hold on. He married Hungarian actress Iona von Montag. What are the chances of that? It's even scarier or more odd than the fact that he, you know, ravishly banged, ravishly, ravenously, ravenously banged a yellow-eyed woman named Hetty. He married two women named Iona? Anyhow, I never met a person named Iona. I'm not even sure if I'm saying that right. Probably not. Uh, so he marries her in New York City. 1921, September 1921. He filed for divorce, or she filed divorce, on November 11th, 1924. Three years. Charging him with adultery and complaining that he wanted to uh, her to abandon her acting career to keep house for him. But, here we go. That's the real, that's what really happened. That's what I found. But in the article from 1932, it says, Bella says, I realized that the strange power of Hetty's was similar to the second stage of hypnotism. And, and yet, unlike it, as for my wife, I never saw her again. He demanded to know what she was and, quote, what is this thing you are doing to me? Her response, what? What are you talking about? Her response left him in no doubt that he was dealing with a supernatural being. That I cannot tell you. I want to warn you, though, there must be no third time. If there is, I shall strike harder, she says. Someday, Bella, we shall be together as we should be, you and I. So I guess he met up with her and she was all hypnotizing weird again. And then, she, you know, banged her and she left again. Sure, why not? All right. <clears throat> After a show, he said, I found Hetty waiting for me in my changing room. And she spoke to him in a low, deep voice that chilled the actor to the core. He said, there must, there must be... No, she said, there must be no third time, Bella. I came to you in Budapest, and you felt my power. Here, across the water, you will feel it again. You are fighting against it, but no, there is no use. You belong to me and always will. Let this woman you have married go. Now I get it. So this is all Bella, or all Hetty talking to him. Got it. Um, he demanded to know what she was, and she said, uh, you know, she's I, that I cannot tell you. I want to warn you, though, there must not be a third time. Marriage, that is. I'm with it now. Hetty's telling him he can't marry for a third time. See, I'm telling you, the story's all wonky bullshit. So, he uh, says, da, ba, da, ba, boom. Um, she vanishes into the night, and Lugosi's marriage of four weeks ended in divorce. No, no. Married in September 1921, divorced November 1924. Not four weeks. His next marriage, four weeks, but we'll get to that. Um. This forced Lugosi to, to contemplate who or what Hetty was. And then he remembered that in the arms of my old nurse, I heard the tales of vampires and saw their victims. Ah, yes, as I grew older and could take notice of things 
about me, I saw many a young man and a young woman pale and stricken and seemed to die with no cause given. Yeah, it's 1920s. People just died like that all the time. It, you, you weren't healthy people. That's when like every movie from the 1920s, someone coughs into their handkerchief and they look down in the handkerchief and there's blood. Yeah, it's tuberculosis. People are dying is what I'm saying. So again, very different real life to what this article says. He was married for four years, not four weeks. All right, but let's keep going with the article though. Still not done. Hedy's coming back again, people. Hold on. He said, I had a skeptical mind. I read wildly, widely, and I made a brave attempt to laugh off such nonsense. Folklore gone mad, I told myself, and I would shake off the charnel house odors of such foul superstitions. Yet that was not to be. He said, it was whilst touring with Dracula in 1927 that Lugosi met Beatrice Weeks, a young wealthy widow, and they struck up a friendship and corresponded after the troupe carried on the tour. In late 1928, the troupe arrived in San Francisco and within, within 10 days of arriving, yep, Bella weds Beatrice. So there you go. He said, two nights after my marriage, when the curtain rose, it seemed as if the world crashed at my feet for there, just had it been in Budapest and then in New York, two yellow eyes held mine from the front row. Hetty, calm down. The moment I saw Hetty, I knew that she still held me and that my marriage was again doomed. Heartbroken, scarcely wanting to live, I told Beatrice, my wife, that it was all over. My first two wives have been Hungarian and they're, they're a, we are a mystic people, a psychic race who feel they at least had understood if only that it was something I could not explain, Beatrice could not. Pause here. Like I said a minute ago, yes, Bella Lugosi did marry Beatrice. That part is true. He married her on July 27th, 1929. Whoops. Not in 1927, like the article said. So wrong info. Uh, she filed for divorce on November 4th, 1929, accusing Lugosi of infidelity. So there is one thing that I've learned about Bella Lugosi. The more I look into him, that dude fucked everything. Hey, he, man, any chance he could, he was like, can I put my dick in it? I'm gonna put my dick in it. I mean, he was banging left, right, and center. So yeah, infidelity. I can see that only because of a yellow dyed woman with tiny little sharp teeth. I don't know about that, but anyhow, it lasted from July 27th, 1929 to November 4th, 1929. So that's not even four weeks. July, August, September, October, November. It's like five months. Anyhow, um, let's continue with this article that I'm almost done with, I swear. The fear that Hetty would strike harder echoed around Lugosi's mind and perhaps her power did lash out for in May, 1931, three months after Dracula became a cinematic success, throwing Lugosi into the limelight. Beatrice Weeks Lugosi, was dead at 34. My third marriage had lasted but a week. No, not true. And now Beatrice, upon her soul, be peace, is dead. Lagosi, quote unquote, lamented in 1932. All right, there's so much stuff that's wrong. This part was the one that was reprinted in 1960, uh, by the way. Uh, it says that Lagosi was interviewed during a visit to England in the 1950s. Uh, J. Eugene Chrisman in 1932 described Lugosi as a haunted man. He went on to state that he believed that Lugosi was telling the truth as he could not sort, he was not the sort of man to make things up and did not tell the story for publication purposes. How do you know that? Uh, further to this Chrisman guy, he said that he had talked to a man who remembered Lugosi's strange behavior during one of his performances and he stated that, hey, yes, he saw Hetty, she had appeared to him. Then, um, uh, the tale goes a little bit wonky and it's next person that says it might be true is Mr. LP Walter, a relative of Lugosi's mother's side who in writing to Richard Davis stated that when Lugosi was stage starting as a stage actor, he was quote haunted by a mysterious cat woman. Apparently she always turned up in the stalls where he was performing, gazing at him, uh, gazing up at him with her glittering green eyes, not yellow. Okay. Um, and said to him, you and I are two of a kind. In the night, in the end, you must join me. Yes, I know. You want to come up here? You can come up here, but we're not. Come up. All right. I love you too. But I got to finish the story. I'm almost so close to being done. All right. All right. You can stay up my, stay on my lap. There you go. 
Uh, let's see, 1933, Lugosi married 20-year-old Lillian Arch, and that marriage lasted 20 years, so he did get married again. Screw you, Hetty, and your green-yellow cat eyes. Uh, lasted 20 years until 1953. <clears throat> that part is true. Perhaps fearing that Hetty could come for him or Lillian, Lugosi made their first home, quote, safe against invasion of any kind. Yet, after his marriage to Lillian, Hetty was never seen again in human form. Doesn't say what form she was. He then married for a fifth time to Hope, Hope Leniger in 1955 on August 16th, 1956. Sadly, Bella Lugosi died in his sleep. All right. Lots to unpack in that story. Like I said, it gets regurgitated everywhere that this is 100% true. Well, no, it's not. In just a little bit of research that I did, I could debunk a lot of the dates, the facts, all that fun stuff. Um, but... I can't 100% debunk the cat-eyed lady part of it. So if you can, please, down below, clickety-clackety and let me know. Um, I don't know. It's Halloween. That's all I'm saying. There you go. But we aren't done with Bella Lugosi. Oh, no, 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 no. Real quick. He is also said to haunt both his last apartment and one of the homes that he owned. Uh, Bella Lugosi's apartment at 5620 Herald Way in Los Angeles uh, I told this one um, on an old episode. <clears throat> uh, he's supposed to haunt that. He's supposed to haunt that apartment. I didn't say that on the old episode, but he supposedly haunts that apartment. That's where he died in bed in his sleep. But um, this this part of the story does deserve to be repeated, even though I told it on an old episode. Uh, Bella Lugosi would walk daily to his favorite cigar shop at six four two three Hollywood Boulevard, and then when he died. The hearse with his body drove from the funeral home where the uh, the W Hollywood, the, the hotel is now. And um, it was supposed to just go up and stop at the uh, cemetery. Boom, done. Everything's sweet and good. But the horse-drawn carriage, all of a sudden the driver loses control of it. I don't know if it's horse-drawn carriage, was it? No, it said hearse. I think it is a horse drawn. I really think it was a horse drawn carriage. Anyhow, doesn't matter. Whatever the guy was driving with the Lugosi's body in the coffin to go to the cemetery, he lost control of it and he couldn't regain it. It stopped. Boop. Dead stopped right in front of the cigar shop. That's kind of cool. That's way cool. I love that kind of can't prove it's ghost, but you can't prove it's not a ghost kind of thing. Uh, but his, his ghost has also been seen at one of his home, one of his homes. And let me click on that so I can get you that info. That home is at 2829 West Shear Drive, Los Angeles, California. Gorgeous, absolutely gorgeous home. Um, last uh, appraised at $4 million. Um, if you got that kind of money laying around and you want to live in a house that has supposedly Bella Lugosi's ghost, there you go. But it is absolutely gorgeous. But the article says, does Bella Lugosi's ghost still haunt this $3 million at the time? Hollywood Land Tudor? It's been over 80 years since he died or since he slept in this house in Beechwood Canyon. But um, whether it's called Westshire Manor, Castle de la, Castle la Paloma, or simply the Bella Lugosi house, the remodeled mansion is now for sale at that time in 2017 for $3 million. The hillside LA home uh, is perched right underneath the world famous Hollywood sign. And it is gorgeous. It's beautiful. But many residents of the house have said that the house is haunted. He's not the only celebrity that uh, that owned this house. Actress Kathy Bates lived there for several years. Um, in 1999, she sold it to John Cryer for of uh, two and a half men. Uh, for uh, and then he sold it in 2004 for 1.3 million dollars. So <clears throat> it's jumped up a lot in the past 20 years. But they're saying that a lot of the people that live there, uh, it doesn't say if it's Kathy Kathy Bates or John Cryer, say that the ghost of Bella Lugosi is often seen walking through the house. That's cool. That's a cool house. That's a cool haunted house to have. But. That about does it for Bella Lugosi, but even though we've hit an hour, that doesn't do it for this episode, because I want to continue on with another great of classic horror movies. I want to go on to Lon Chaney. It's a real quick one. Many people have seen, well, not him, but they've seen his ghost at stage 28 in Universal Studios. Now, sadly, <clears throat> pardon me, 
Sadly, stage 28 at Universal Studios was demolished in 2014 to make way for, I think, the Transformers ride. I'm pretty sure that's where. Anyhow, but it's where they filmed Phantom of the Opera. It's one of the oldest sound stages ever. And it was incredible. I got to go on that sound stage once. It was beautiful. You could you could just feel the old Hollywood in that sound stage. But anyhow, um, his ghost was once seen running the catwalks as his phantom cape was tied firmly around his neck. Other times, they just saw Lon Chaney in there. So uh, sad that it's been destroyed. I doubt that if you if it is the Transformers ride, I doubt that while you're riding the Transformers ride, you're going to see Lon Chaney's ghost. But you never know. Keep your eyes out. Maybe you'll see it. All right. That was a quick one. Let's move on to Boris Karloff for another quick one. Another classic horror movie guy. He's been seen at his Rose Garden. That is 2320 Beaumont Drive in Beverly Hills, California. The uh, home was previously owned by Catherine Hepburn. She had believed the house was haunted. She reported, quote, a jiggling latch on the doors and moving furniture all the time. It was also said that there was a figure that um, that would loom over the guest bedroom. Yeah, that's way worse than uh, jiggling door latches. Uh, it was after this she decided to move. But when Boris Carlos moved in, Boris Karloff moved in, he said that it doesn't seem to be haunted at all. He didn't feel that at all. Uh, but he was very proud of his rose garden and grain of salt. But legend says, and this seems to be written everywhere in various different forms. So it, it probably it could be true, but I can't prove it. Some say grain of salt it. Legend says several of his friends willed their cremains to him, their ashes, uh, so they could be permanently residing in his rose bed. And uh, he was such a nice guy. They said that he would do that. If anybody, any of his friends did that, yep, he'd sprinkle them on his roses in his rose garden. I don't know. Um, but you apparently you can see the rose garden and you can still see ghosts there, whether it's Boris Karloff or some of these people that he sprinkled their ashes on them. Um, I hope, hopefully, hopefully I can do a very quick like portable paranormal investigation just outside the Rose Garden. That's hopefully that's my plan very soon. So that'll either be here on YouTube or maybe on TikTok. I got to get that started or maybe on the Patreon, definitely on the Patreon. But anyhow, I thought that was pretty cool. Once again, it's 2320 Beaumont Drive. You can still see the Rose Garden. Apparently the, 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 um, the lot's been subdivided a few times, so you can't really see the house anymore, but you can still see the Rose Garden. All righty. Up next is another person I've talked about before, Mr. Rudolph Valentino. Yeah, I've talked about him ad nauseum because his ghost is busy as hell. He's seen everywhere around Hollywood. Musso and Franks? Sure. Why not? Uh, other parts of Hollywood? Sure. Why not? His house? Sure. Why not? But listen to the old episode. I'll go through them all. But his ghost has also been seen. Uh, let's see, at the Knickerbocker Hotel in Hollywood, the Hollywood Knickerbocker Hotel. But here's the thing. I was like, really, that seems kind of strange. And I looked into it. So Rudolph Valentino died in 1926. The hotel didn't open until 1929. So facts are hard for a lot of sites because a crap ton of sites say he used to frequent the bar there so often before his death that his ghost is still seen there to this day. No, he never went there. It opened three years after he died. He didn't frequent the bar often. Stop regurgitating that BS web websites and YouTube channels because I've seen a bunch of those too. Um, he didn't. But let's stick with the Knickerbocker though. So that is cool. Apparently his ghost is seen there. Why? I don't know. Maybe he was like, boy, I want to go there one day. Oh crap, I died. And now he just goes there. I don't know. Um, he waited for it to be finished building. And he's like, I'm gonna have a drink there. I don't care if it kills me or not. But um, let's stick with the Knickerbocker because it's an absolutely incredible building. I used to actually go there at, uh, they used to have a coffee shop in like either the ground floor or maybe even like below the ground floor. But it was beautiful, old Hollywood building, old Hollywood, like dark wood. And you could smell like the cigarette smoke. You could just smell the old Hollywood from it. I used to love going there. Unfortunately, it closed down. And I don't think I don't think it's open to the public anymore. But I'm going to go there. I'm going to drive by there um, coming up very soon, either to do a portable paranormal investigation from my car or just outside the hotel. Or if I can get in there, if like maybe there's another coffee shop or something else that opened up in there, 
I will 100% do it from inside there. But uh, the Hollywood Knickerbocker was designed in 1923 by architect E.M. Frazier, but the building was built as the security apartments and never opened. So even though it was built in 1923, it was never opened. Rudolph Valentino did not go there in 1926, um, before 1926. It was finally completed in 1929, rechristened the Hollywood Knickerbocker Hotel in June of 1929. Pardon me. Here is a quick list of paranormal activity at the Knickerbocker. The first ghost is the bestest boy ghost ever because it's the ghost of Speck. An English setter dog. Uh, Speck lived at the hotel with his human hotel manager owner, uh, Jack Matthews, in the late 1930s, early 1940s. Legend says Speck would often wander the halls in life and could also be seen ringing the doorbell to his master's office. Then, grain of salt. Some people think that uh, he could ride up and down in the elevators on his own, supposedly using his paws to press the buttons. Now, residents of the Knickerbocker nowadays say that they have seen an old English setter dog riding the elevator with them, and others have spotted Speck, Speck, yeah, striding down the hall or waiting obediently outside his former master's old door. That's cool. I want to see, I love ghost dogs. I'm all about that. I want to ride in an elevator with a ghost dog that pushes the buttons himself. Uh, next up at the Knickerbocker is actress Frances Farmer, who lived at the hotel in 1943. That's when police knocked on her door at noon, which was a warrant for an unpaid DUI fines and hands. And when they eventually opened the door with the pass key, they found Francis, Nan uh, Francis naked and beyond drunk. Hold on. <clears throat> That's right. She refused to cooperate with the cops, went crazy and clawed and scratched them. Eventually... She was wrapped in her own shower curtain and carried through the hotel, kicking, spitting, and screaming. One reporter wrote, she did not surrender peacefully. Yeah. Uh, her ghost is still seen at the Knickerbocker. Thankfully, not in a drunken ghost in a shower curtain way, but just, you know, walking around there and people are like, oh, crap. I looked up what Francis Farmer looked like. That's that ghost I just saw. Then we got film director D.W. Griffith, Griffith, who spent his last years at the hotel. It's also been seen there. He died. People have seen a strange, dapper-looking old man in dated clothing hanging out in the lobby, <clears throat> swinging his cane and humming to himself. Employees have uh, even told some witnesses. Hold on. I'm losing my voice. Hold on. Sorry about that. Employees told some witnesses to ignore the ghost saying, yeah, that's just old Mr. Griffith. That's some mellow freaking employees. I don't care how many times you see a ghost. You should always be amazed you're seeing a ghost. Uh, next up, the ghost of Irene Gibbons, who I had a very similar story to Francis, sadly. Uh, it gets brutal for a second here, people. 1962, Irene checked into the Knickerbocker with the intention of ending her own life. Uh, she tried to drink herself to death, left a suicide note. When that didn't work, she then jumped from the window to her death, landing on either the roof of the lobby or the umbrella thing that goes out front of the lobby. I can't really tell. Um, but it's outside the Knickerbocker. Uh, people have seen her ghost all over the hotel, including the lobby and outside the Knickerbocker. Uh, residents who also reported a middle-aged woman in odd clothing, her hair all in disarray, standing in one of the windowsills of the building. So they were like, oh my God, that woman's going to jump. She jumps, they look down, there's nobody there because it was a ghost. Sometimes they see her leap from the window and crash onto the roof. Sometimes they just see her and she disappears as soon as she jumps. Sadly, hopefully it's a residual energy. She seems to be in a loop doing that over and over again. So if I want to do a paranormal investigation of the Knickerbocker and try to see Irene Gibbons ghost, my guess is go on the day that she died. So I'll look that up. I'll figure out what the day, maybe hopefully even the time and see if I can see residual, you know, her jumping again and again and again. I hope not, but you never know. Uh, like I said, Knickerbocker, old Hollywood. It's gorgeous. I want to do a full, real proper investigation there one day. Hopefully, fingers crossed. The next famous ghost is on this list is Marilyn Monroe. And again, no, not the spots that I talked about previously on older episodes. Marilyn Monroe is sent to haunt, said to haunt, the Brentwood home she was found dead in on August 4th, 1962. 
from an overdose. That's air quotes here, Kurt. Or murder. Um, yeah, uh, I still think she was murdered. But this episode is not about that. Uh, she's seen there with her ghost poodle, Math. Uh, the ghost dog's cry is said to be heard from the outdoor courtyard and the pool area. And Marilyn is seen all over the property. And um, yeah, like like that old episode, she's seen everywhere, including room 1200 of the Roosevelt Hotel. She's seen at the Hippodrome on the uh, Santa Monica Pier in Mirrors. This one's kind of neat. Legend says, if you visit the Hippodrome on the Santa Monica Pier, the, the merry-go-round, on a Santa Monica Pier, late at night and watch just the mirrors themselves on the carousel. You might catch a glimpse of Marilyn Monroe sitting on her favorite bench near the gift stand. That's worth a try. If you're there anyway, why not check it out? Up next is a uh, good old frozen head, Walt Disney. Don't worry. That's just an urban legend. Uh, he did not freeze his head. The technology wasn't there yet, but there is a legend that his ghost may still be at Disneyland. That's right. Some employees and guests say that Walt is seen at Disneyland. One former cast member, Daryl Wagner, Wagner, he said the Disneyland Railroad that circles the park, the train command center, has a board that shows where the trains are on the tracks. Late at night, in the far corner, a train would show on the board, and the whistle would blow, even though there was no train out there. If you don't know it, Walt Disney loved trains. He even named one of the cabooses at Disneyland after his wife. Um, let's see, uh, people, when they saw that little dot on the board and they heard the whistle, they would go, oh, that's just Walt's train. Um, this guy, Daryl also said Lillian Disney, his wife, it's the Lily Bell is the, is the, uh, the caboose, but that's not important right now. Lillian, his wife made sure that Walt wasn't seen smoking in public areas around kids. So he used to go out of the staircase behind his apartment to smoke. Well, after Walt died, a security supervisor used to smell cigarette smoke back there almost every night. He used to hide to try and catch the smoker. He said he never did. He never found cigarette butts, but he always smelled fresh smoke. Uh, he finally concluded that it was Walt sneaking a last smoke. Uh, guests have also seen Walt Disney all around the park, including Fantasyland, the Haunted Mansion, and is in his old apartment above the uh, fire station, which they always had the light on for him, which is very cool. I want to see Walt's ghost. Uh, let's move on to uh, Old Hollywood Theaters to wrap this up. Real quick, we have the Vogue Theater. It's now the Supper Club LA Theater. Opened in 1936. But before it was a theater, it was the site of Prospect Elementary School. Supposedly, I can't prove this. Until 1901, when the school was destroyed by a fire, killing 25 children and a teacher. Reports say nine victims of the fire, including teacher Miss Elizabeth, are still seen in the theater. Now, the final one for this episode, the Hollywood Pacific Theater. Uh, that's at 6433 Hollywood Boulevard. Originally opened in 1928 as the Warner Brothers Theater or the Warner Hollywood Theater, uh, Sam Warner reportedly cursed the theater when it wasn't completed in time for the jazz singer. I don't know if that's true. I do know he was very upset they couldn't get it open in time for the jazz singer, and apparently he was very irate. Um, then he did something worse than his curse. Uh, he freaking died from a, cer a cerebral hemorrhage the day before the film's New York premiere. Uh, people think that's why his ghost has been seen in the lobby and the offices of his theater. Yeah, this guy got really upset about this and caused, uh, you know, his brain popped. Many security guards and employees have seen him wander the, the theater, even up in the elevator, the booth, all over the offices. And even people walking by the theater looking in have seen him in the lobby looking out at the streets. So, again, it'd be an, a real easy one to do a portable paranormal investigation just out front. Uh, so hopefully I can get that done in October. If not, stay tuned. I will. All righty. There you have it. There's a bunch of old haunted Hollywood. Uh, YouTube people. If you made it this far, thank you very, very much. Again, click uh, like, click the bell, click subscribe, all that fun stuff. Leave a comment below. Tell me if you like it or if you didn't like this episode. Uh, I don't know what to do on YouTube. So this is just something fun for you guys. If you want to watch me, anybody. Want to watch me ever do an episode and just kind of read from my little uh, synopsis there, my little outlines, you can. Just go to YouTube, paranormal underscore almanac. Uh, let's see. What was your favorite one from this episode? Look, I want to see Walt Disney's ghost, but pretty much any of these old Hollywood ghosts, I really want to see. Because again, I love old Hollywood. I love old ghosts. Put those two together and you got yourself a happy Kurt. Um, 
All righty. Let me see. Should be right about there. Once again, I'm your host, Kurt Sandig. This has been another edition of Paranormal Almanac. And you two people, you don't get to hear me do the backwards thing. That'll happen after you guys. <laughs>